And Father God, again, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. Father, what an opportunity that we have to come once more into your house. And Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have to be here today. But Father, we should never take advantage or forget what freedom you have provided in our lives that many of our brothers and sisters all over the world do not share. Many of our beloved brothers and sisters, Father, are in great turmoil or in persecution. We pray for them today. Ask, Father, that your presence would be near them, that you would strengthen them, you would encourage them, you would surround them, Father, with your love and your mercy and your grace, for your grace is sufficient, Father, in all things. We ask, Father, that you be with us today, that all hearts that have gathered here this morning, Father, would be open to receive your message, that it would be your word, Father, that would speak to our hearts. It would be your word, Father, that would encourage us to live more for Jesus and admonish us to live less for this world. And, O oh, Father God, be with us as we diligently seek your will and your word that our hearts would be made glad that as we leave this place, Father, we would determine in our heart to live our lives for you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 36. We're cruising right along. Here we are just getting ready to go into the life of Joseph. The life of Joseph. Joseph is one of my favorite Bible characters in the Old Testament. There is no one in the Old Testament is more like Jesus than Joseph. My mother-in-law, who gave one of her early uh, theses in her early school life, wrote a, a thesis on the life of Joseph. It was one of her favorite characters. We've often thought maybe perhaps the, one of the first people to meet her when she went through heaven was Joseph. We don't know. You got it wrong, Evelyn. <laughs> but anyway... The bottom line is, folks, Joseph is just around the corner. I'm excited about the possibility of studying the life of Joseph. But before we study the life of Joseph, we have to study the life of Esau. And that's always been a problem for me. The question is why? I like Joseph. Don't really like Esau. I would pick to run around with Joseph all day long, and we'd go out and get a cup of coffee and do different things like that. You know, I expect heaven is going to be a lot of fellowship, and I think there's going to be a lot of eating in heaven. My pastor used to talk about that. He said, one wing of my mansion is going to be Publix, and the other one's Winn-Dixie. And he said, the angels are going to come, and they're going to minister to me. They're going to fix me all manner of fried chicken. He said, I can't eat it here. I'll eat it there. I think we're going to meet people like Joseph because Joseph's there in heaven. And I think we're going to sit down and talk with Joseph. And I think Joseph's going to share some of the great things that we missed within the scripture text because of our limited ability. But here we have Esau. Esau was a man of the world, much different than Joseph, much different than his brother Jacob. But Esau, we're going to see, was a man of the world. I don't understand why Scripture text is where it's at today. This is the kind of chapter in chapter 36 that normally many of us would just gloss over it as we read it. Read it quickly. It's just a genealogy, preacher. And many times we would just perhaps even skip the chapter. Oh, well, you know, I can't pronounce those names, so let's just go to another chapter. But you know what we miss as, as Westerners, we miss this Mideastern flavor of understanding the truths and the necessities of genealogy. Genealogies are important. If they were not important, God would not have put it in his word. Turn in your Bibles. Keep your ribbon here in Genesis. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy, all the way back to the New Testament. In 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
Many of you perhaps could even quote this scripture text. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles says all Scripture. All Scripture. Well, I like the Gospel of John, preacher. And I, and I like the book of Revelation, and, and boy, the book of Romans is a doctrinal Bible that's very rich indeed. But why do I have to take a look at the 36th chapter of Genesis that talks about Esau, for goodness sake? Well, I have some of those questions too, and one day we're going to find out. Lord, why did you put that in there? It says, for your edification. <laughs> Just simple as that. So that we could learn. Simple as that, is it not? Why are these passages put in the Bible so that we today can learn from them? That we can take these genealogies and learn from each and every one of these people. This chapter is one that, again, we might decide to skip over. But it is the Word of God. And before you think about skipping over another passage again, like I have done and you have done, let us stop and think. This is God's Word. He has a message for me. Turn your, into your Bible to the book of Psalms, right in the middle of your Bible. Again, it is very important. Psalm 119, probably if you turn right to the middle of your Bible, you'd be there. The longest chapter in the Bible. The longest chapter written in the Bible, and it is written about God's Word. God thought it was so important that we understand His Word that He put it, boom, right in the middle. And He made it the longest chapter. Look at Psalm 119, starting with verse 9. Psalm 119, starting with verse 9. I've got all the way over to 99, so I'm in trouble. i go over a couple of pages here. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. Statutes. I will not forget your word. That's the purpose of Scripture. How can a young man stay pure? How can an old man stay pure? How can a young woman or an elderly woman stay pure? By following the word of God. We have forgotten that today. And many of us are being more like Esau than we are Jacob. And today we see more and more young people who have grown up in children's, uh, into Christian homes becoming children of Esau rather than children of Jacob. We see this chapter is what the Hebrews call the Toldoth, which means the historical records. This is an account here in chapter 36 of Genesis of the historical record of Esau. Literally, he becomes the father of the Edomites. This is where we're going to see that it's very important to the Jewish people to understand this because they're going to run head on right into the Edomites when they come back from Egypt. Moses is writing this text telling them, we're going to run into the Edomites pretty soon. And this is where they come from. This is how we're going to understand who they are. And this is why we're going to leave them alone. We see here, this, we have this account, this record of Esau's family. He becomes this father of the Edomites. And it chronicles a man and whose, whose life and his family's life follows the way of the flesh, the way of the world. Why study history? Because we need not repeat what has already been done. My pastor's father used to say this when he would preach. 
You do not live long enough to learn everything by experience. And it's very true. And so rather than going out there willy-nilly in life and trying to learn everything by on-the-job experience, let us read the Word of God, let us settle into the Word of God as a map, as a, as a way of direction in our life that we may have an admonition, a warning, a doctrine of reproof that you and I may not have to live like this. That God will not one day say, I told you so, you just didn't read. And so we see this, this toldoth, this historical record. In verse 1, this toldoth, we see simply, now this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. I want you to see three words. We're still in my introduction, folks. I want you to see three words. Genealogy, that's the toldoth, the historical record of Esau. Esau, I want you to take a look at Esau. And I want you to see the word Edom. The word Edom. We see the genealogy, the toldoth, the history of his life. Folks, one day we're going to go before God and he has recorded our history for posterity that you and I may have an understanding of our life lived for God. Everything we did for God. Why did, why did this happen to me? Why did this come in my life? Why, was I, why did I go down this path? Many times God is going to say, because I wanted to protect you. There are times God's going to say, I don't know why you went down there, John. You chose to go down that way. I gave you ample warning. I gave you time, but you didn't listen. But we see here that this genealogy, this toldoth, this historical record, God is bringing into account that we would not be like Esau. And Esau is the one who is a man of the world. You remember the story of Esau. He's the twin brother of Jacob. A twin who, when he was born, he was hairy. I mean, he had hair all over his arms. The, the guy was just an, an, basically a very hairy baby. The other twin was holding on to his heel, the heel snatcher, Jacob, who was coming on after him. There was a battle to who was going to be first. You know, that's not uncommon with twins. That's not, I did a study in my undergraduate work on twins, and it's not uncommon for twins to literally want to be first. And so there is a struggle within the womb. But this was a very unique battle to the point that literally Rebecca said, I don't know what's happening to me. I've got this, this horrible feeling. What's going on? And was told, you're having a battle. Two nations live in you. And we have this Esau, this man of the world, who became what we would call a man of the field. He was a hunter. He was a gamesman. He was a, a, a wild man. He was a mountain man. He liked everything about the outside world. And he went out and did all his hunting. But his brother, Jacob, was a man, the Bible describes, as a man of the tent. Now, there are some people who say, well, that's because he liked to cook and he liked to do stuff like that. He was kind of a mama's boy. That's not true. That's not true whatsoever. Jacob was not a mama's boy, even though he was very close to his mother. Just because you're close to the mother doesn't make you a mama's boy. Sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> the, the bottom line is Jacob was a man who dwelt in the tents during the day as much as he could. He did work around the house, so to speak. But he wanted to hear the stories from Abraham. And he listened to the reports of the men who sat around the tent and talked about days past. He heard from his grandfather Abraham firsthand what it was like to talk to Noah. Abraham lived in the time, the latter days of Noah, and learned what the world was like before the flood. And how violent it was and how horrible it was and why God judged the whole world because of what was going on. Jacob understood those things. Esau did not. He went out into the field. He went out and hunted game. He went out and did his thing. And you know what? Isaac, his father, loved him for it. There was just something about Esau that Isaac loved. But we see here these two brothers were so different. Esau's background necessitated the fact that he would not understand the things of God. Now that doesn't give him an excuse to 
to sin. But what it does, it gives him a blank gun to fire against the devil and his enemies. And Esau was not prepared for the world in that aspect. And so we see Esau, we see the genealogy, the historical records of Esau, the man of the world. But we see also that he has a new name, Edom, Edom. Everybody gets a new name in the the book of Genesis. Abraham was Abram, now he becomes Abraham. Jacob become Israel. Everybody went up, folks. Abraham went from Abram, the father of a family, to Abraham, the father of nations. Jacob went from the schemer to Israel. Esau went from the red man to Edom. Now, Edom is a reference to, you remember the story, if you'll turn back in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 30. Now, this name Edom refers directly back to this scripture text. So that every time somebody saw Esau and called him by his new name, Edom, they thought of this. And at verse 25, or verse 30, excuse me, and Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Remember, he sold his birthright for a, pot, a bowl of pottage or a bowl of stew. He was a sensual man who had a physical appetite for nothing but the moment, the now, the here and now. He did not think of tomorrow, did not think of, of, of yesterday, did not think of what went on before, who suffered what, who went through what, learned nothing from the examples of his leaders, learned nothing from the failures of his leaders. He was a man who could only think of right now. Edom. Edom. And every time he heard the word Edom, he got this taste of stew in his mouth. Sometimes I wonder if Esau did not flaunt his name Edom because he was proud of the fact that he was a man like that. You know, there are some people who are proud in their ignorance. Do you know that? There are some people who who joy in the fact that they're abnormal. We call them sociopaths. (laughs) But they, but they, they they are absolutely happy to be ignorant. They're happy to be abnormal. They're happy not to be the way of, of the society. Now, sometimes that's a good thing because sometimes society labels you, labels you as abnormal. God labels you as a man of God. But we see Esau was a man who relished in that. It was not a good name, but it was a name of contempt. But it was a badge of courage that Esau was willing to wear. It was a badge that everyone would see and say, that's Edom, the one who sold his birthright for a bowl of stew. And you see, Esau would simply say, I didn't want it anyway. Who wants to go to heaven? Who wants to live for God? There is no God. There is nothing like this. I don't have to live like this. And so we see that this Edom, this name Edom, is also synonymous with, with rebellion against God. You see, that's what sin is. Sin is basically in its, I don't want to use the word purest form with sin, I guess I would use its basis form of sin, is the aspect of rebellion. God cannot tell me what to do. And that's the foundation of sin. I can do what I want to do. I can say what I want to say. I can go where I want to go. And I can live the way I want to live. And I can marry who I want to marry. And I can be what I want to be. And I don't care that God cares. And that was Esau. And that's his rebellion. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, it says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. The writer of Hebrews, which I believe was the Apostle Paul, he said that that, uh, Esau was a fornicator, that Esau was a, a literal profane person. 
And this is the nature of the world. So we're going to see a, a look at Esau. In the next few weeks, we're going to take a detailed look at Esau through these genealogies. And what's very unique as we study each person, we're going to look at their name and their names and what it means, as we have seen before, is going to tell us a little something about that individual. Otherwise, why would God put their name in the Bible? You see, we see lists of names and we say, how boring. But you see, I've got my name on a list that's exciting to me. John's name, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and there's a purpose for that. And that's not a list that you look at and say, oh, hum, it's just a list. That's a list of people who are going to be in heaven. But there are many lists. I made the dean's list in my undergraduate work. It wasn't a good list, but I made it. There are many types of lists that we have in life, folks. But this was the list that God gave with the names which mean something that tell us about things. Let's look at the personal lineage of Esau in verse 2. Starting with verse 2, Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. That speaks volumes. If we had time, I could go into a complete study on that. Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Aholibamah, the daughter of Anna. And Anu, the daughter of Zebulon, the Hivite. And Bashamath is Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nabajoth. Now, Ada wore, bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Bashamath bore Raul. And Aholibamah bore Yesu, and uh, Yalam, and Korah. These were the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. And then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle and all his animals and all his goods, which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together, and the land where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau dwelt in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. We see, first of all, the personal lineage of Esau. We see the lineage of the son of Isaac. And what we see as a son of Isaac, Esau is a failure. Later on, we're going to see Esau in the pagan lineage or legacy of Esau. And we're going to see him as a son of this world. But today we see in verses 2 through 5 Esau's manifest progeny. In verse 2 and 3, look at his malicious spouses. Esau married all the wrong women for all the wrong reasons. Look at verse 2 and 3, his malicious spouses. In verse 2, we see first of all, Ada, his wife of seduction. Look at verse 2. And Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. Now we see here that she was a Canaanite. In reality, she was a Canaanite of Hittite extraction. Ada was the daughter of Elon, and Elon was the Hittite, a Canaanite tribe. Now, what you have to understand about the Canaanites is that the Canaanites were a loose confederation of nations. There weren't just one nation. We, we went through a whole series on this on Wednesday night uh, called the Gentile Kingdoms of the Bible, and the Canaanites were found to be a loose confederation. You had the Hivites, you had the uh, Horites, you had the, all the different ites all over the place. And they all made up basically the Canaanites because they came originally from the lineage of Canaan, who was the grandson of Ham. Okay? Or the, uh, yeah, the grandson of Ham. And so what we see here is these Canaanites were a, a loose group of people. Well, this girl was from the Hivite tribe. And Ada means bedecked as an ornamental or as an ornament, as adorned as an ornament, which meant that she was beautiful. She wore everything on the outside to make herself look good. Now, folks, that happens a lot. I don't have any problem with painting the barn every once in a while. That's a good thing. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about painting the barn with the wrong advertisement on the roof. You understand? Ada was the one who basically painted the barn to advertise that somebody like Esau would pay attention. 
we see here that she was adorned. Certainly she was one to look at. She was one of a type of woman that was loaded for bear. And Esau was drawn to a woman like that. Esau saw Ada and went, oh my, that's the woman I want. How do we know this? Well, we'll talk about it in a little bit how we know this. Because I'll tell you, first of all, because of his parents' reaction. I can tell you, because of his parents' reaction, this was this kind of woman. She was loaded for bear, as I said before, and she was also a woman who broke parents' hearts. We see in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 35, and they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. Esau did his thing, went on out and willy-nilly, I'm running to and fro, and I'm saying, hey, ho, ho, women, I'm here for you. And Esau just did his thing. Brought home two girls, which probably gave his mom and dad enough to talk about that night. But both girls were Canaanites. Look who followed me home, Mom. The first one, Adash, beautiful to look at, wild woman. And he says, I'll want her. And I'm going to have her. And she's mine. And I married her. Guess what? Didn't ask Dad. Remember, in, the, in this time, dads, the fathers, made the arrangements for marriage. This was not just a Jewish custom. This was a custom for all around. Esau said, hey, well, skip that. I got my own deal here and went on down and got Ada. Brought her back. And then he got a holy bama or bema. Holy bema. And brought her too and said, hey, look what I got here. And the Bible says it grieved them. The Bible says it grieved their mind. That's all they talked about at supper. That's all they talked about when they weren't there. And we see here a horrible situation. A horrible situation. Verse 2, we see his wife of sensuality. A holy bema. And a holy bema was a horite. Now the horites had a strong connection to the Anakim. Now, I don't know if you remember the Anakims. Those were the giants. And they were a group of people who had proceeded genetically from the giant group back before the flood. That God had cursed the world because all mankind had become evil in his sight. And so this, this connection, this physical connection to the evilness of the pre-flood times was in this tribe. And so here, I don't know if she was a big woman or what. I don't know. But we know here that she was connected to this. And there's a strange connection also, not only this pre-flooded people, but her name means the tent of the height or the tent of the high place. Now, anytime you see that terminology of a high place, it talks about pagan worship. And what we have here is that this woman was from the t of this religious connection. She was a heartbreaker to Esau's parents, but she was a very important person in her family lineage. She was probably a priestess of their religion. Now, before we say, well, she was a good religious girl pastor, maybe there was some difference of religions and difference of faith, but, you know, that's no big deal. She was at least a religious person, thought about God from time to time. She was a temple prostitute. Hey, Mom, look who followed me home. Oh, what do you do? <laughs> well, uh... I, I, uh, I spend time at the temple. Oh, that's wonderful. You, which temple do you spend at? Do you go to the Baptist church down the street? No. I'm a member of the Canaanite temple of the, of the up and above and out the door church. What do you do there? Well, I help people worship. You help people worship. How do you do that? And then it came out. 
Mom and dad were grief of mind of these two girls. Esau said, I don't care what mom and dad think. All I know is they're good looking. They're good looking. By the way, this wife became his favorite because he spent a little bit more time with her. We know that because she had the most children. Her father was Anna, and Anna was a Horite chieftain. And this family had a great connection with the Canaanite society. So Esau, in marrying this woman, married up the Canaanite ladder. He saw her not only as a beautiful woman and as a woman who was well versed into some of the practices of the Canaanites. And Esau said, that's a benefit. But not only that, Esau said her dad's a chieftain. You see, I'm not really in good stead with my dad. And he gave all the connections to being a good boy to my twin brother, Jacob. He got the blessing because I sold it for a pottage of stew. He got the Abrahamic blessing because God chose him over me. And so I've got to be for me and my own. And so I've married into this family so I can go up the ladder of the Canaanites. I don't need God. I've got my own way. Do you see how this is going? Do you see why mom and dad were upset? Do you see why mom and dad thought, oh my goodness, what are we going to do here? And so we see in verse 3, his next wife, his wife of spite. You see, mom and dad said, oh my, Esau, what have you done? You've married these women. They're going to take you into idol worship. They're going to take you into, oh, I can do whatever I want to do, no problem. And so he understands they don't like his two wives, so he marries somebody else. Look at verse 3. And Basemath's Ismael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. That's who he married. He married the daughter, the twin of Basim, uh, Nebajoth. The reason why Nebajoth is mentioned, the Jewish commentaries say, because uh, Bashamath was the twin sister of Nebajoth. And so we have here he's marrying the daughter of Ishmael, which was a cousin. Not really a big, huge problem back then. You didn't get these problems until later on after the Mosaic Law. Wasn't against the law, but this woman was not a believer. She was out of the family, so to speak. And then there was that problem between Ishmael and Isaac. It's kind of like the Romeo and Juliet thing. You know, you go off and marry somebody from a family who's constantly warring, you're in trouble already. Thanksgiving is going to be terrible this year. <laughs> Christmas, oh my. What are we going to do? You've married who? But we see here Bashalmath. Now, Bashalmath is, again, the twin. So twins are marrying twins. Her name means sweet fragrance, balsam, which has a sensual nature to it. This always talks about a sensual nature. The balsam was a, a fragrance. It was used in many of the temple practices. A beautiful woman, sensual in nature. Esau, again, was attracted to these type of women. Women of the world. Esau married her to spite his parents. Oh, you want me to marry one of ours? So, okay, I'll marry your, your brother's daughter, the one you hate the one who hates you, the one who wants to kill you. I'll marry her. I'll go up his ladder. Maybe he'll appoint me to be the successor. Maybe he'll give me what I need. Do you see the spite that's in this? And so we see Ishmael was Isaac, was with Isaac here. Or excuse me, Ishmael was with Esau here. Now, what we have to understand, one of the interesting things is where these people go and what families they make. In verse 4 and 5, we see his maverick sons. He has five sons, by the way, by these three women. In verse 4, we see the son of Ada, Eliphaz. Now, Eliphaz, his name means, my God is gold. Sounds pretty worldly, doesn't it? According to Jewish tradition, he was the friend of Job. You know the one that said, why don't you just curse God and die? That was his wife. But he, Eliphaz says, well, you must have done something wrong. God wouldn't treat you like this if you didn't. Then we see that he was a pious and probably the most pious of all the children of Esau. 
In fact, the, the Jewish rabbis say that he was raised on Isaac's knee, meaning that he spent a lot of time with Grandpa and not with Dad. So this is the son who's probably, of all the sons, the firstborn, is probably the most pious of all of them. But you see, again, they're living among the Canaanites. Wilmington said this, it may be said without exaggeration that the Canaanite religion was the most sexually perverted, morally depraved, and bloodthirsty of all the ancient history. That's why God said destroy them when they came back from Egypt. We have been in Israel where we were there at Megiddo, and there they found a huge Canaanite altar where they sacrificed babies to. They would, they would give sacrifices to Moloch, literally, and burn babies to, to, to their God. And then there, then there is all the different types of gods. It was unbelievable what they would do. He brought all of this into his family. And Eliphaz was the best. Verse 4, we see the son of uh, Bashamath, Ruel. And his name means friend of God. Interesting. Remember this name, friend of God. It's important. What was the, why did the family name him Ruel? Why was it important that his name be friend of God? Well, this must mean they're spiritual people, Pastor. Do you remember the story of Abraham and how God identified Abraham? He said Abraham was a friend of God. What a title. And you see, this is the family's attempt to bring the power and the authority and all of this stuff of Abraham to this son. We want you to be like your great-grandfather, Abraham. We want you to be in charge of great things. We want you to do great. And now what parent doesn't want that in their child? What parent doesn't want the best for their child? And that's what they're saying. They're not saying religiously, we want him to be a man of God. What they're saying is, we want him to be like Abraham. Now, folks, I, I hope my children aren't like me. I hope they're more like God than me. I understand that you and I are, are sinners saved by grace and that sometimes we fail God. Many times we, we ignore what God has for us. Abraham had problems. Abraham had problems. And, and, and so they're saying, not that I wanted to be a spiritual man, but I wanted to be a man like Abraham. The status of a great grandfather. Verse 5, we see the sons of Holy Bama. She had three sons. His name was Jeush, Jeun, Laam, and Korah. Now, Jeush's name means quick to help, hasty. He was quick to impress mom and dad, trying to win their favor, always wanting to please, someone in need of good guidance. Had a great opportunity, was a, a wonderful kid, but you had to kind of steer him correctly. I love kids who want to, want to, want to do their best, don't you? But you imagine letting a child who has that interest of doing his best, doing what he wants to do, and just letting him go, not directing him? Do you know a lot of times the one who directs our children today is totally outside the parents' reach? You know, there was once said that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, that's what they're doing here. They're raising this child who wants to do everything he can please just like Esau wanted to please Isaac, this child wanted to please everybody, and so he was being raised to be that kind of child. Be careful. Direct your children. Teach your children. Train your children, the Bible says. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart. It doesn't say if you've got an eager child to please, then let him go and let him please whoever he wants to please. And so we see this child was quick to please. And so they, they basically trained him, someone in need of good guidance. Jalam's name means hidden, or he will be hid. One of the interesting things about that name, hidden, and that name will be hid, is where we get the English word occult from. Now here we have a mother who has already been a priestess, 
in a Canaanite temple who knows all the ins and outs about the worship of false gods. And here is a son whose name means hidden or occultic, and he is drawn into this world of the occult nature. Raise up a child in the way he should go. Why? About the things of God. Not about the things of this world. It's not enough that you raise a child in religion. It's enough that you bring a child into a relationship with Christ. You know, they can be great Baptist kids and go to hell. They can be great kids and no matter what denomination you want to label them with, no matter what denominational label they wear, folks, if they're not in a relationship with God, then they're not saved. And the bottom line is simply this. You raise a child into the ways of God. Esau knew better. Obama had a different idea. And then there was Korah's. His name means baldness. I thought, who would name their kid Baldy? I mean, I have a hard time myself. You do understand. I, didn't, I was born that way myself. I had very little hair when I was born. Now, my brother, his head was just completely filled with hair. And, you know, I'm always very, very envious of those who can keep their hair. Some of us who are bald, you understand what I'm saying, right, Jim? <laughs> well, I just wanted to get an amen from you, brother. The bottom line is simply this. Why was he called baldy? Because, you see, he wasn't like dad. Dad was hairy. Dad, when he was born, man, he looked like a chimp. People would come by forever and say, man, that's an ugly baby. That baby is hairy. But this child was different. And you wonder what it's like being a child in a family when you're different. There's something different about you. There's something about you that you just, you know, maybe just push you over there. Maybe you get the last bone on the plate. Maybe you get the last piece of broccoli. Whatever, you know. Maybe he was just hurting. But his name was Bald. I don't understand what that meant except the fact that I put this in relationship to his father and it makes sense. Jewish tradition says that Korah was really Eliphaz's son. That means Eliphaz, who was a son of a concubine of Esau's, that this was a kind of a strange relationship. This was a relationship that was at least, at the very best, a relationship of, of uh, strange character, that it was a, 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 a thing of having a father's concubine as your, as your playmate. But the bottom line was it was a strange relationship. That would have made him his son. Some people believe that he was his son-in-law, that he <laughs> married Eliphaz's daughter, which even makes it stranger even still. I'm telling you, these, these families, these Canaanite people, this was a child raised in a godly home who gets mixed up with the Canaanites and all of life is changed. That's why the Bible says that we are not to, to, be, un, that we are to be not to be equally yoked with unbelievers. We're not to be yoked with people who don't believe. Why? Because water finds its lowest point, beloved. It's never going to be, I can grow them up to be a good man of God. I have heard all my life, preacher, I thought I could change them. And it's not them that change, it's us, we change. Why? Because we have a sinful nature. And Esau became like the people of the world. And the tragedy was he was bent that direction in the first place. And that choice was his. I love all my children. I pray for them every day, as I'm sure you do too. And I pray that God would put a protection around them. But I have no choice in the matter that they step out of that, that sphere of protection. I have no choice whatsoever. I have no control over that. And I don't want to control them. They're adults, for goodness sake. I want them to make the decisions for God. 
I don't want them to do it because they hear dad or see dad or I better be good or whatever. That was good for five and six years old, for goodness sake. But we want our children when they grow older to make decisions to bring honor and glory to God. And that's important. We love them. We care for them. We want the best for them. But it's their choice. And Esau chose poorly. Don't beat yourself up. Mom or dad, don't beat yourself up. Many times we say, the first thing we say is, what have we done wrong? When in reality, it was Esau's choice all along. And in his mom and dad's face, here am I. Here are my wives. Here are my children. You have to accept us. And we're going to see what happens after dad dies next week. But beloved, it's not enough just to say to a child, I'm dragging you into church. It's not enough. Because they will choose. And Esau chose poorly. That's why we pray for them. That's why we pray that we don't become like Esau. And that this world would not have a pull in our lives. Well, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. And oh, Father, sometimes we come to these scriptures and we are overcome with With confusion, perhaps, Father, sometimes we wonder why it's even in here that all your word, all the scripture, Father, is given by inspiration and you gave it to us for a reason. And it's here before us and we see the life of Esau and we say, oh, what a tragedy. But, oh, Father God, we are raising generations of Esau. We are raising, Father, those Esau's who want nothing to do with God or the church or anything else, and oh, Father God, please help us that we will not be like Esau. And oh, Father God, let our hearts be brought to pray. Let our hearts be brought to seek. Let our hearts be always available for the Esau's in life that, Father, we might share with them the way back home. And Father God, I pray for people here today there's someone here, Father, who's not born again. The Holy Spirit has already spoken to their heart, saying there's something different here, and you need the Lord. And Father God, if there's someone like that today, if they would just come and take me by the hand in this time of decision and say, Preacher, I want uh, this forgiveness of sin. I want to be able to go to heaven. I want Jesus in my life. And, oh, Father God, we'll show them in the Bible how they can do that. And Father God, there are those who need to come and pray. This is your altar, Father. This is the house of prayer. And this is the altar where we can come, as many of the great patriarchs did. Come to the altar of God and pray. Let them come, Father. Whatever decision is on the hearts of men and women that you yourself have placed there, let it be done. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.